Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to introduce the electric displacement field D, so we'll talk about the way it's defined and motivate why it's defined the way it is, and then we'll talk about some of the properties that the displacement field has and how its properties differ from the ordinary electric field E. So I'd like to start off by considering the little diagram that I've sketched out here. So what we have is a block of dielectric material, and on one side of the dielectric material I've put a little plus representing a positive point charge, and on the opposite side we've got a negative point charge. So what those charges are going to do is set up a non-uniform electric field between them going from plus to minus. Now I've deliberately drawn this asymmetrically with the negative charge closer to the surface of the dielectric than the positive charge is, and what that means is that the electric field will be stronger towards the right hand side of the dielectric than it is towards the left hand side. Now the effect of that external electric field will be to pull the little negative and positive charges that make up the dielectric in opposite directions, and you therefore get all of these little dipole moments being induced within the material. That's all of the sort of ellipse shapes with the pluses and minuses that I've sketched inside the cube. And you'll notice that I've kind of schematically shown these dipole moments getting physically bigger as you go from left to right, and this is just my way of representing the fact that the dipole moments are getting stronger as you go from left to right because the field strength um, is strongest at the right hand side. Now the most important idea here is that because the dipole moments are not all of equal strength, the various pluses and minuses in the bulk of the material are not going to cancel each other out, so you'll end up with some net charge density that varies as you move across the material. Now the difficulty that arises is that that charge density is going to be producing its own electric field, and that electric field will combine with the electric field that you originally applied to make some net electric field. This is a bit of a problem because if you were to actually set up this system, you would presumably know how much external charge you are placing into the system. In other words, you would know the size of your positive point charge and your negative point charge that you place on either side of the dielectric, but you won't know in advance how much charge density is within the dielectric because that charge density is induced in response to the charges that you place outside the dielectric. So it would be kind of convenient if we could define some new type of electric field that only had those exterior charges as its source. Now we have to be very careful about how we define the term source. I'm going to be defining that more mathematically precisely later on, but that's the basic motivation for introducing the displacement field. So let's start making this a bit more quantitative. We're going to start with one of Maxwell's equations, the one that tells you that the divergence of the electric field is equal to the local charge density divided by the constant epsilon naught. Now, in systems like this with dielectrics, it's conventional and very convenient to separate your charge density rho into two parts, which I'm going to write down and then explain what they're all about. So you say that the charge density is the sum of a free charge density, which I'm going to call rho f, and a bound charge density, which I'm going to call rho b. So the bound charge density rho b is defined to be any charge density which is a result of the polarization of the material. In other words, the charge density that arises from those unequal pluses and minuses um, that get induced in the material. Well, the most accurate way to define what rho f is, the free charge density, is just any charge density that is not due to polarization. In particular, that means, for example, in my diagram on the left, um, you would have spikes of free charge density at the locations of the positive point charge over on the left and the negative point charge over on the right. Those are free charges rather than bound charges because they're not a result of polarization. It's worth pointing out that the term free charge density might be a little bit misleading because the charges don't have to be free to move around in order to be considered free charges. For example, we could be holding those point charges in our diagram in place so that they can't move, but they're still called free charges. So the definitions that I gave just now are really the most complete definitions. So combining this stuff together and multiplying both sides by epsilon naught, we find that epsilon naught times the divergence of E is just the free charge density plus the bound charge density. Now, an interesting fact about the bound charge density is that it is related to the polarization vector in the material as follows. It's minus the divergence of the polarization, and this capital P vector, the polarization, is just defined to be the dipole moment per unit volume within the material. If you want to see a full derivation of why that's the case, then take a look at my previous video. So then we end up with the divergence of a vector field on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, so why don't we move those onto the same side and combine them into a single divergence so that we can write this equation as the divergence of epsilon naught e plus the polarization vector is equal to the free charge density. So what we're going to do is define a new vector field 
which is the thing that we're taking the divergence of in that equation above. And we're going to call that D the displacement field. So by definition, the displacement field is equal to epsilon naught times the electric field plus the polarization vector. Now, of course, the reason why that's a useful thing to do is that the divergence of the displacement field D is then just the free charge density as we've shown above. Now remember that the geometrical interpretation of what divergence means is that it measures the extent to which field lines of a vector field are coming out of a certain point and therefore we see that the displacement field D kind of satisfies the property that we were hoping for earlier um, which is that it only emerges from uh, free charges rather than bounce charges. Another way this is often phrased is that free charge can act as sources and sinks of the displacement field whereas bound charge can't. Now this is not to say that you need a free charge density in order to have a displacement field, right? You can have the right hand side of this equation being zero, but you can still have a non-zero D field. It just means its divergence has to be zero. And I'll say a bit more about that later on. Now this defining equation for D takes on a particularly simple form under certain circumstances, in particular when we have what's called a linear dielectric. Now by definition, a linear dielectric is one where the polarization in the material responds linearly to the electric field that you apply. In other words, the P vector is proportional to the E vector. And conventionally, we write the proportionality constant as epsilon naught times chi. Um, so we've got P equals epsilon naught chi E. Now chi is called the electric susceptibility. You can tell that it's dimensionless because if you look at the definition of D, you've got P and epsilon naught E added together, which means that P has the same unit as epsilon naught E. Now on the left-hand side of our equation down here, you've got P on the left and you've got epsilon naught E on the right. And so for the two sides to be dimensionally consistent, the susceptibility needs to be dimensionless. So it's essentially just a number that measures how easily a material polarizes in response to an electric field. And it's also worth mentioning that it's not necessarily a scalar. I've written it here as if it's a scalar, but it may be a tensor in the case where the polarization and the electric field are not parallel to each other. And that can happen in anisotropic materials, um, which are materials where it's easier for the charges to displace along certain axes um, than other axes. So if you then go back to your defining equation for D, you'll conclude that D is, well, you've still got your epsilon naught E, but now you're gonna add on epsilon naught chi e under the assumption that p is proportional to e and then of course you can do some factorizing and take out a factor of um, epsilon and a factor of e and write this as epsilon naught one plus chi e and then you can define another derived parameter we call it epsilon r and it's called the relative permittivity of the material it's just one plus chi that allows us to write this in yet another form as epsilon naught times epsilon r times e and if you want to write it even more concisely you can just write it as epsilon uh, e where epsilon is called the permittivity of the material which is the relative permittivity times the permittivity of free space epsilon naught so we end up with three different interrelated parameters the susceptibility chi the relative permittivity epsilon r and the permittivity epsilon which essentially are all just measurements of how easily a dielectric material polarizes but depending on which equation you're using, you might choose one over the other to make your equations look a little bit nicer. As we mentioned earlier, chi can be a tensor, which means epsilon r and epsilon itself can also be tensors in the general case. Now, just a few more words on this idea of free charge being the source of D. Now, to clarify what's going on here, I wanna consider another of Maxwell's equations, this time the one that tells you about the curl of the electric field. So the curl of E is minus the time derivative of the magnetic field B. Now using this equation, you can take the curl of your defining equation for D and you find that the curl of D is going to be equal to, well, I'm going to flip the terms around. I'm going to have a curl of P term first and then your curl of E term um, with that prefactor of epsilon naught can be just written as uh, minus epsilon naught times B dot. Now, the first point we can learn from this equation is that electromagnetic induction works for D fields just like it does for E fields. In other words, a changing B field can induce a circulating D field. For the remainder of the video, though, I want to focus on electrostatic. So we're just going to ignore this term just for simplicity and think about what is the significance of this curl of P term. Now let's start by considering the case where P is indeed proportional to E, like in a linear dielectric. Now if P is proportional to E, then the curl of P is proportional to the curl of E, but in electrostatics, nothing is changing with time. So curl of E is zero because B dot is zero in an A-static system. Now in such a system, this curl equation down here would just become curl of D equals zero. So it would be an irrotational field, the displacement field. Now let's additionally specify that there are going to be no 
free charges around. We're only going to have induced charges, bound charges. And if we refer back to our divergence equation up there, the divergence of D in that case would also be zero. Now, if you have a vector field whose curl and divergence are both zero, that implies the vector field itself is also zero. Now the conclusion of those considerations so far are that if you just have an ordinary linear dielectric, then you can't have a D field if there are no free charges around. Now suppose instead that you had some kind of special material where the polarization was just sort of frozen into the material. In other words, rather than being a pure response to an applied electric field, the polarization was just an inherent property of that material. Now, if we have a material whose polarization of field has a non-zero curl, then this last equation down here tells you that the displacement field would have a non-zero curl as well, and therefore the displacement field couldn't be identically zero anymore. If there's no free charges around, the divergence is still zero, and so the conclusion is you have a field that doesn't have any sources or sinks because the divergence is zero, but it has a non-zero curl, and that type of field um, is, is one that forms closed field lines. So your D field lines would go in loops if you had a material with a uh, sort of fixed in polarization. So the main point I'm trying to make there is that just because free charge is the source of D in a vector calculus sense, it doesn't mean that you need a free charge in order to have a non-zero D field, as long as you have a D field which is purely uh, circulating in closed loops. Now I'll be saying a bit more about that type of material in my next video. Those are called electrets, the electric analog of magnets, but I think we can leave it there for now. So thanks for watching and I hope you'll join me again soon.